Hello everybody out there in podcast land. It's me, David Robertson, and I'm here as ever with... Uh, Chris Carter. Hello, hello. Hello, and we are... Uh, we're not in the same room this time. We're, we're meeting virtually across the interwebs. Um, across, well, I, I guess across um, the Lothians today. Yes, indeed. I'm out here in the middle of the country in Gifford, and Chris is in the sprawling metropolis of Edinburgh. Uh, but fr- from uh, from the Lothians to Canada this week, we have an interview with Wendy Fletcher, and this is uh, by Carmen Celestini, and the title is Religion and Multiculturalism in Canada and Beyond. So let's just pass over to, to Wendy and Carmen to find out what that's about. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Wendy Fletcher, the President and Vice Chancellor of Renison University College, uh, an affiliate with the United... <laughs> University of Waterloo. Dr. Fletcher is a co-author of A Space for Race, Decoding Racism, Multiculturalism in the Quest for Belonging in Canada and Beyond, which we'll be discussing today. Dr. Fletcher, thank you for sitting down and talking to us. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple questions about the book. Um, The book contains personal stories of the authors and others, and it opens up with the merits of belonging. Can we expand on these merits and the personal experience within the book? Thank you. Thank you very much um, for the question. It's an important question to start with. As a historian, I think narrative is all, and personal narrative, and how it links to a broader narrative in terms of telling the story of where people have come from and where we hope to go is really key. So, identifying as a historian, I believe there is no genuine objectivity. We can we can struggle for it, but of course, we all live within our subjective context and experience. So, for both of us, Kathy and I, in writing the book, to uh, locate ourselves in the context of the question of ethnicity because the book is of course really struggling with that the question of a racial and ethnic identity against the backdrop of Canada's vision of multiculturalism was very important so Kathy of course came to the book as a Jamaican immigrant to the project and, and, and uh, as a Canadian scholar and I um, raised as an Anglo speaking um, Euro descent settler who over the context of a complicated story both found that I had some indigenous um, uh, ethnic background, racial background myself, and in the context of my journey was adopted into uh, other Indigenous contexts as well. The point of it all being that in, in, in the backdrop of identity politics today, having the one who is speaking uh, feel free to say something about who they are and and be the ones who define who they are is, is very, very important. Yes. In the world of the university right now, especially identity politics is all, who has the right to say what about who. So our first premise by sharing the stories of how we understood ourselves and inviting others to do the same about themselves as the story of the research unfolded was pretty key because we're staking the ground for an individual's right to say who they are, regardless of what anybody else wants to say about that. The, the identity of the self is first formulated through one's own construction of narrative um, and and belonging. Wow. Yeah, and that really comes through very clearly in the book, definitely. Um, so these merits that um, that you want to expand on, and what are the merits of belonging? Is it the individual voice, or are there other merits as well that you think are important in our expression of who we are? So I go back to a, perhaps a not, I'm also an Anglican priest, um, and so if I step back outside of the world of the academy for a moment and I think about the spiritual dilemma of the human being, um, I think that the spiritual dilemma of the human being in every generation, but perhaps never more acutely than in this one, is a question of belonging. We all need to belong, we need to be valued, we need our story to have meaning and place. Uh, and in the context that we often find ourselves today, um, a dislocation, unbelonging seem to be very dominant motifs. So for me then, setting the, the story in the context of the question of belonging or not belonging as perhaps the truest, me- truest measure of whether or not Canada's vision of multiculturalism has actually worked the way the framers of that vision intended has been very important. Yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> how do you think we should move towards belonging and how would you define that sense of belonging? So I have this understanding about who the human being is, right? I start, I start micro and go macro. For me, usually I start with the trees and go to the forest. And my fundamental philosophy of the human being is that every human being matters infinitely. Yes. And that there is nobody 
nobody like you. <laughs> There's nobody like me, right? Every one of us is incredibly unique. We're all on a path and a journey, and we all have a contribution to make to this world, and it's best becoming that is uniquely our own. And sometimes contribution of harm, depending on how the story goes yeah. for all of us on any, on any given day. So the world I imagine, the Canadian society I imagine, is a place where where that is how we understand respect. We talk about respect a lot, mm-hmm. but if you go to the dictionary and you look up what the word respect means, it's actually, in my view, and, and particularly from an Indigenous perspective, not a very helpful definition. The word respect says to esteem or value someone because of their gifts, skills, abilities, or contribution. Well, in an Indigenous context, that's not what respect means. How respect is to esteem, to value, to offer, to recognize the dignity of the other simply because they are. And for me, that is the basis of a truly inclusive society that is capable of supporting the, the parameters of what the original namers of multiculturalism imagined so that just because we are means we have a right to be here we have place we have value and should be accorded dignity so genuine multiculturalism a multiculturalism that worked would do that yeah definitely and i think that's where this is my own personal opinion but as we're sort of you know having the politics of becoming and these things are happening that i think this is really fundamental to those ideas as we're moving forward politically um What can a religious studies perspective bring to the table in this conversation? A good scholar, in my view, of religious studies understands that there is no one right voice, no one right path, that you take a hermeneutic of questioning Mm -hmm. um, to the journey of a religious uh, studies discourse. So insofar as the religious studies imagination understands that the story is framed by multiple voices, multiple experiences, multiple philosophies, uh, and multiple truths, like competing yeah. truths, uh, as a necessary way of telling any discourse, it, it contributes that. There is no genuine multiculturalism, there is no healthy pluralism in a society which doesn't understand that what you believe and what I believe may not be the same thing, but they're both true because they're true for us and we're holding that discourse and that voice as a piece of of the bill. I really like that concept, I really do. Um, How might scholars working in religious studies um, navigate the current political landscape using insights from this book? So what the book does in part, like I'm a historian, so a lot of the book is actually historical. Mm One of the things I learned as a teacher, first, um, I'm I'm religious studies and history. I thought when I first started teaching that people would change their minds based on uh, an idea or a philosophy, Aretha, but they don't. My my experience of of human beings around their prejudices, the, the narrowness or wideness of their worldview actually is more influenced by Um, in this age that's still living, hanging on the edges of a modern discourse, that empiricism actually matters. Um, So I like to say it doesn't, because we've all embraced the (laughs) postmodern thing. But but honestly, when you look at the fact that uh, Indigenous persons in this country received the vote uh, in this country after persons of colour did in the United States many years Mm -hmm. after, and you go, whoa, I didn't know that about Canada. Did we know in Canada that we had a very um, tightly negotiated space? We have a policy of uh, multiculturalism at the same time we are tightly controlling immigration and racializing immigration according to preferred racial and ethnic groups. Did we know that in Victoria, uh, children of the Chinese for decades were not allowed to swim in the swimming pools, were not allowed to shop in the stores, that persons of Asian descent in Vancouver were not allowed to work for uh, uh, certain types of people. So a white woman, for example, could never work for an Asian male and an Asian child was not allowed to go to school in Victoria with a white child. Chinese schools were segregated. All these things are shocking to Canadians, but but they're empirically the case. So while I, you know, along with Pilot on any given day will say, oh, what is truth? There are some things that we just know to be truth, some things that are actually measurable in the story. And so as I worked with students over many decades, I understood that their worldviews were actually more significantly expanded through shocking empiricism than they were through any great rhetoric of a particular (laughs) philosophical worldview. So the only way to get at the falsity of the 
illusion of multiculturalism in the Canadian story was to go after the bedrock of what the, the story actually was through historical detail. So there's tons and tons and tons of historical detail in the book as a way of helping to unmask our own self-delusion about multiculturalism. And I think it's really successful at doing that. I mean, as I was walking in here, I said, this book made me rethink so many things. Like, there was so much that I didn't know about Canada, and now this concept of multiculturalism, I see it in a completely different Failed. Like it's gone now, and it's a very powerful book. And the stories really do tell that. And I think the history is, yeah, it changed my perspective a lot. Um, so now, after I've said that, I'm going to ask this question. But why does this matter in religious studies and in um, <clears throat> understanding of uh, Canada's understanding of multiculturalism as we label ourselves? Mm-hmm. Right. So. Just to link in in the first instance, then religious studies and multiculturalism, we're not as aware in Canada as elsewhere in the world of the extent to which religion continues to be a a huge dividing factor. So as we talk about laying a a table in Canada where everyone is welcome, the, the historically theoretical multicultural table, to not be a way of aware of the ways in which religious difference uh, and deep religious commitment actually lays a table of dissension, animosity, and hatred potentially, rather than uh, respect for diversity is going to be really key. So we think religion doesn't matter in our society anymore, but as the world comes to us, where religion does actually matter in the broader world in a way that it doesn't in a in a fairly secularized Canada today, mm-hmm. um, we are bumping up against not only the assumptions of, of newcomers and other cultures, but our own prejudices. Because if we we think religion doesn't matter, but we're living in a country where the, the newly elected government of Quebec is talking about using the notwithstanding clause to violate the charter of rights and freedoms and disallow people to express their religion in their dress. Um, so I, we, we are on the cusp. I'm writing a, an article right now. I'm working on an article that looks at the tension between uh, the charter of human rights and religious freedoms and contemporary politics, like where the political discourse of the day is going right now. And the two case studies I'm looking at in the book, one is the Trinity Western University uh, law school issue, uh, where it was agreed that um, by the Supreme Court that particular rights and freedoms took precedence over religious uh, mm-hmm. freedom, rights and freedoms. But now the Quebec notwithstanding clause, um, where we see that our political our political machinery has the capacity to override anybody's rights and freedoms, including religious rights and freedoms, if a majority government decides that it wants to do that over anything, like that it's actually our constitution actually allows that, and is a disconcerting shock note into the middle of this story of a Canada where we all feel safe and everybody's rights are protected and everybody has a place and there's dignity for all. But this book freeze frames that story and says, in what was past, that was simply not true. In what is, that unfortunately, simply is not what is true. And with the way the constitutional framework has been set in our country, the possibility of it un- being unmade as racism and xenophobia go wild, as immigration increases in diversity of ways, um, has the, the, the possibility of just really opening a Pandora's box of a kind of Canada that uh, bears no resemblance to this whole notion of respect and dignity for all that we say we prize so much. Yeah, it's definitely um, shocking. I mean, what's happening in Quebec and even here, what's happening here, you know, as we see American politics in some ways affecting us when, you know, we look at Andrew Scheer and what's happening, you know, with rebel media being on their thing, you know, yeah. it's definitely a frightening idea of what could happen here. Yeah when we think of who we are and the safety that we have here in that sense. It's so true. Like, I I honestly believe that the most pressing political question of this generation, for our world, let alone Canada, is how will we live with the other? Yeah. How will we live with the other? How are we going to live with difference? The old model of multiculturalism that we deconstruct in the book talks really about tolerance. We're going to tolerate the difference of the other. The future or a genuinely multicultural vision, or a, or a, be a post-multicultural vision, would actually not tolerate the one who is different, but to embrace and celebrate the one who is different. And in fact, may accommodate the difference. In other words, may oneself be changed because of value and esteem 
for the difference of the other. That's different than the original yeah. multicultural vision. But here's my critique. Can I just tell you, for, for the listener, my, <laughs> my, my big critique of the multicultural vision. Okay, so we have a whiteboard, right? And we have the image of a mosaic. You know, the Canadian yes. mosaic. All the different tiles. We'll put all the different tiles up. We'll put it there. There's Canada. All the different faces. People keep the integrity of their difference. But it's on a whiteboard. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the, the fundamental problem. problem, that we have, we're have we going to tolerate all this difference on top, but what is foundational, what is underneath, is the whiteboard that we've attached to, the, the fundamental assumptions of a Euro-descent, Anglo-speaking, Western value system, mm-hmm. um, which has been laid on top of a red soil, which is here prior to the arrival of European colonizers, um, and which uh, is, is going to determine then uh, how this mosaic actually is able to be lived out. So until we dis- deconstruct that. I mean, the assumption of the normativity of Anglo-white culture, it's scary. Because what what does the new Canada look like? Because what I'm basically arguing is the only way to take account of genuine multiculturalism is to move beyond tolerance and to adapt um, so that I don't know what the new Canada will look like because I haven't been yet modified, adapted, shaped by my original people and newcomer neighbors in the way that discourse will demand if we are actually engaging each other out of respect for, for genuine difference. I really do hope that ends up in our Canada. I really do. Um, I want to thank you so much for participating in this. And Do you have any final thoughts or anything you'd like to add? Or? Um, yeah, maybe just a last one. So I'm a true believer. Like I, the, the, I'm a true believer in the notion that the world is a more livable place uh, when the unique diversities of every ethnic, racial, philosophical, gendered, sexual identity, individual, and is respected in the story. And I do believe that it is actually possible to imagine a social fabric which makes space for that difference to coexist. It's only possible, I think, in a couple of ways. So this is my new book that I'm working on, is actually how how we actually can live into this world that, that we hope for, which is what I think our framers on some level inclined towards, but they didn't want to give up the white the yeah. whiteboard, right? <laughs> so if we give up the whiteboard and start from where we are, we have several things going for us. I mean, we have a good constitution. Uh, and we have a constitution which is not only one that protects the basic notion of, of the rights of individuals to be different from each other, but it also is an adaptive constitution. So the constitution that we have can adapt, it can change. So newcomer voices, original peoples that want to renegotiate the fabric, like it's possible to adapt and evolve through our judicial system in particular, and we can adapt this good constitution that we have. My fear of that, of course, is going to be whether the political will is there, because if we have have the dominance of a majority that actually are willing to override the rights protected in the Constitution because a political will gives it the right to do that, will we ever get to the end of the table? So I'm a believer, I believe it's possible, but only if the principles of democracy are held in balance with the rights of individual and ethnic and racial groups and religious groups and others uh, to be heard on their own terms makes complete sense. I hope so. I mean, it's a frightening time for sure, but I'm kind of hoping on a personal level that what we see happening around us on the south of the border will actually bring out the good in us and make us want to be better and, and do the right thing and include everyone for sure. It, it's so true. I mean, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And I think we have to trust that. Like we're a couple of hundred years into a really strong tradition of liberal democracy mm-hmm. in, in the West. And that is a gift of the West. The West, we critique ourselves for our marginalization of other worldviews, but held accountable to our own best principles. We know that the, the discourse of diversity is the only way forward to a truly strong culture. So if we hold ourselves accountable to those those virtues which are are philosophically strong i think but will mean that we have to change i think we will find a way forward i think we will definitely thank you so much dr fletcher my pleasure thank you Sorry to interrupt the episode, but we just wanted to let you know to remind you about our Patreon link. Uh, The Religious Studies Project has always been free since its inception, uh, but we know that there's a great problem in academia with uh, people not being paid for the work that they're expected to do, particularly early career scholars. And we at the RSP want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So you can help if you can spare even one pound a month um, by going to patreon.com slash Project RS and subscribing. We know that these podcasts are very useful for people who are teaching, 
and people on their learning. So if you can help um, either by subscribing there or by making a one-off donation using the PayPal button on our website, it'd be greatly appreciated and will help us keep bringing you this podcast for free and fight against exploitation in academia. But now, back to the episode. Wonderful to hear about that. Um, an excellent interview there again from Carmen and interesting just at my headspace at the moment is quite in all the sort of multiculturalism discourse because I'm I'm in the final stages of, of sorting my PhD to the monograph saga. So I'm, I'm in all the, the data where, where people are, certainly here in Edinburgh that my informants were, were very much operating under a, a felt oppressive discourse of sort of state multiculturalism and how they were trying to navigate that. So I find a lot of resonances there in that interview. Excellent. And good to have some material on race there because uh, that's a subject which is conspicuously absent in our uh, programming up till now. And uh, well, you know, not entirely, but not to the degree we should be thinking about it. But uh, we hope to change that uh, in the near Absolutely. future. Um, so next week we've got a um, we're continuing our sort of uh, catwalk of podcasts. And uh, so we had last week we had stuff about um, Christian beauty pageants with Chris Black and Chris Black has recorded another um, podcast this time with Nancy Ross speaking about um, LDS garments and agency. So um, you may have heard things about uh, Mormon magic underwear, but never really heard much more. Well, come back next week and you'll hear a lot more about it. <laughs> yes, I'm presuming this is not the same as my old flatmate's lucky underwear, but uh, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll. Well, find lucky. It. In yeah, it depends on your definition of uh, of luck and reward there. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think he expected to get a plan at the end of it, but uh, we'll we'll find out. Um, so uh, join us next week for that. I don't think we have any other news or anything to announce at this point, do we? Yeah, not not really, except just um, you know you'll have heard there about the the Patreon um, options uh, and do. Remember that all patrons get access to these special bonus episodes that we've been recording. So recently, uh, Ben Margus's um, episode of Discourse went up there, um, and you can check that out if you are a patron. Yeah, it's a really good episode, and we're going to hopefully have a regular episode um, from him um, going forward. We've got several more of those lined up uh, for you, and that's only going to become a more more common features going forward um yeah but uh you know those discourse episodes they're, they're not they're not throwaways or stuff we edited out these are created especially for uh, patreon and they really are uh, worth one dollar a month but uh, anyway I, well, i'll stop the sales pitch for now and i'll say um as i as ever thanks for listening thanks for listening the RSP is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions. The Religious Studies Project is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, SCIO, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation, charity number SC047750. Brought to you by founders and editors-in-chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson, and managing editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Marek Sullivan and Rebecca Barrett-Fox and our opportunities digest by Ella Bock. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock with audio editing by Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford, sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop and video editing by Jonathan Tuckett. Don't forget you can support the project by using our amazon.com.co.uk and .ca links or donating at patreon.com slash projectrs and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, iTunes and other portals.